in this video we'll talk about the principles of fluorescence microscopy as the name suggests these microscopy employs the principle of fluorescence for imaging so to begin with we need a fluorescently labeled specimen we can use the technique of immunohistochemistry to label our specimen in this case we have a nuclear antigen which we can label with a primary antibody and then a fluorophore coded secondary antibody also we can express some of our fluorescently labeled proteins or gfp labeled proteins in a particular cell to visualize a particular structure or where they localize anyway moral of the story is we need a fluorescent specimen to begin with now let's focus on the light path so the light comes from a lighthouse which might be a mercury arc lamp which can also be a led source anyway the light passes through this filter cube and then it gets diverted to the specimen through this objective lens and it is focused on the specimen via this objective lens and inside the specimen there are fluorophores so it would be excited and the electrons would jump from ground state to the excited state eventually it would be relaxing and ultimately leading to the emission of fluorescence the fluorescence light also travels through the objective pass through the dichroic mirror and ultimately get collected to the detector or it forms the image in our retina in case we are visualizing it with our eyes anyway let's look at the excitation and absorption spectrum for this illumination in this case we have illuminated our specimen with a blue light and our specimen had gfp expression in these cells so there would be a fluorescence which is corresponding to the green wavelength and the emission spectra looks like this green wave this spectra now this emitted light has a higher wavelength than the excitation light because there is a energy loss during these vibrational relaxation so obviously the fluorescent emission has a lower energy that means a higher wavelength and this shift is known as the stoke shift now let's look at the filter cube in bit more details we have excitation the excitation filter dichroic mirror and emission filter in the filter cube that directs the light in specific orientation and direction so let's look at the microscope anatomy to understand the light path in a better fashion so the light is generated in the lighthouse and it is passing through the filter cube and ultimately getting getting to the specimen via the objective by changing the filter wheel we can change the light sources into different wavelengths such as in this case green or even red now let's focus on the blue light because our specimen had gfp in that so our illumination light is basically blue so after excitation the fluorescence which is emitted would be passing through the objective and ultimately it would pass through a couple of mirror and prism ultimately it would come to our eyes and form a image in the retina or it could be also channeled towards the detector like a camera and we can see the fluorescence image of the cells in this case a cytosolic gfp is expressed in the cells so the whole cell looks pretty much green actually a microscope has a array of filter cube that means there are more than one filter cube uh, present in a filter wheel kind of setup in the microscope by rotating this filter wheel we can select our wavelength of illumination of the specimen we can illuminate gfp rfp or whatever fluorescent molecule we like so filter cubes are really essential part of a fluorescence microscope now let's look at the application of fluorescent microscopy in biomedical research and then we can look at the application in the clinical research so first we can study several subcellular localization of a protein using fluorescent microscope in this case we can tell that firstly the protein in the left is expressed on the cell membrane secondly the protein was localized in the um in the nucleus and the third it was localized in the mitochondria we can also use this kind of technique for visualization of the specimen in real time under fluorescence microscope and this is known as live imaging let's say we want to look at the fusion dynamics of mitochondria so mitochondria are is labeled with a particular protein 
which has a mitochondrial localization signal and it is GFP tag. So the mitochondria is now fluorescing. We can track its dynamics over time and we can see how it has fused with each other. So this is only possible with live imaging and this is a big advantage because biological processes are dynamic like this cell moving from one end of the tissue space to the another end. And this is really important for developmental biologists who wants to look at coordinated cell migration during development. Also, biology is all about motion. So looking at how vesicles are trafficked from the cell body to the synapses is one of the criteria that neurobiologists use. So neurobiologists track the vesicle motion through this new axons. So there are specific transporters which would take these vesicles and they would take them to the synapses. Now if we label the vesicle by some means, we can actually look at the motion of these vesicles and calculate several parameters such as movement time scale, movement kinetics, movement direction, etc. Now neurobiologists also used specific calcium sensors to record the neuronal activity in real time or to look at how neurons are responding to a particular stimuli. That means fluorescence microscopy can be used for a wide variety of biomedical research. Now there are certain disadvantages of fluorescent microscope. First of all, the image that are produced in fluorescence microscope is generally blurry. Photo bleaching of the specimen is a big problem and the cells which are under investigation in a live imaging paradigm, they might get uh, damage by prolonged exposure with that high intensity light. So there could be photo damage of the cells as well. Now poor signal to noise ratio is another problem. Majority of the cases, the fluorescence microscope shows very high background and there is a reason behind it. In a moment, I'll discuss that. But photo bleaching is the biggest disadvantage of fluorescence microscopy. And when photo bleaching happened, the fluorescence is kind of lost permanently. Now let's talk about the resolution of the microscope, which can be determined with the help of this formula, d equal to lambda divided by 2 mu sine alpha or 2 Na. Now if this is the cell and this is the objective and this is the light which is illuminating the cell, then the half angle through the optical axis is known as alpha and lambda is the wavelength of the illumination light and mu is basically the refractive index of this media. If we plug in all these value, we would get a value of d and d is basically the minimum distance between two points to be told uh, to be considered as resolved. In the first case, we can see the points are well resolved. In second case, they are barely resolved. And the last case, they are unresolved. Now, all the disadvantages of fluorescence microscopy can be overcome by other flu fluorescence microscopy modification techniques, such as confocal microscopy, which is kind of like a upgradation of fluorescence microscopy. If you want to learn more about confocal microscopy, you can click on this link in the I button. It would take you to the video. Now, in fluorescence microscopy, the biggest problem is due to the wide field illumination. So wide field illumination means like we are illuminating the whole specimen all at a time. Let me give you this example in a better fashion. So cell is a 3D entity, right? Let's say there are fluorophores present all over the cellular cytoplasm. And we are illuminating majority of these fluorophores. But where are we recording from? We are kind of capturing one particular plane. So once we capture fluorescence from one particular plane, the fluorophores or the fluorescence correspond to other planes can also contaminate the fluorescence or they can lead to a high background. And that is the biggest reason why we get a lot of background in immunofluorescence microscopy. Now, in biomedical research and clinical application, we can use immunofluorescence. Let's talk about the, I mean, let, let's talk about the overall importance in biomedical research. But let me tell you that even if blurry images are produced in the fluorescence microscope, still this technique is invaluable for clinical research. Techniques like anti-nuclear antigen test or ANA test, which is 
done to detect presence of autoantibodies or to confirm whether a patient has an autoimmune disorder requires the technique of indirect immunofluorescence. Here, specific fluorescence pattern allows the pathologist to understand whether anti nuclear antibodies are present or not. Also, other kind of diseases like bolus, pemphrigoid, and pemphrigus vulgaris, all these skin diseases can be detected by performing immunofluorescence technique. So, in clinical aspect as well, immunofluorescence and fluorescence microscopy is really important. If you want a detailed video on that, you can click on the i button to get it. If you like this video, give it a quick thumbs up. Don't forget to like, share and subscribe. You can fund my channel by Patreon or via Bhim UPI app. If you are an Indian viewer, you can use my QR code for paying. Your small contribution means a lot for me. My courses are also present in Unacademy. You can use my code AP10 to get a 10% discount. As usual, don't forget to like, share and subscribe. Thank you.